We're in Matthew 14. We're going to start at verse 22. Uh, an incredible story, of course. All, the, all of the stories in Scripture are. Things that Jesus did. Uh, there's debate on whether or not He did this more than once, but uh, it's recorded in three different of the Gospels, at least a version of this. Verse 22 says, Immediately Jesus made His disciples get into the boat and go before Him to the other side while He sent the multitudes away. When He had sent the multitudes away, He went up on the mountain by Himself to pray. Now when evening had come, He was alone there. Now the boat was in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw Him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered Him and said, Lord, if it's You, command me to come to You on the water. And Jesus said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him. And he said to him, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Other versions of this say that the, not only the, the storm stopped and it calmed, but the boat was actually now instantly at the location it was going to. Just like that. Okay, what about this story? Well, we've, we've read this, heard this, talked about this through the years, but one of the things that, that as I've been saying in the last several months with these messages, it's always more than just about what you see on the surface. Last week we were talking about Jesus feeding thousands of people with a sack lunch. It wasn't just about that. Although it was about that, it was about more than that. It was about people understanding and recognizing who the source is. And the, I called it the, the incredible uh, genius of God, that, that creative genius that He can create out of little or nothing. Well, why was Jesus walking here on the water? Well, part of it was because He was taking a shortcut to get where he was going. He had gone away by himself to pray, which he needed to do periodically because everything about his day was, was people sucking life from him. Just literally like, like you, when you plug your phone in or when you're using your phone throughout the day, it's, it's using up its energy. Something's changed with my uh, iPad and it's wanting to, wanting to go dim just every few seconds, I think. I, I went and told it never to go dim, and it's not listening to me today. <laughs> but anyway, this, this circumstance was twofold. It was that Jesus was indeed taking opportunity when He needed to be alone, but He needed to also catch up with His disciples, and they didn't have airplanes yet and, and trains, and He was going to need to be on the other side of the, the sea. So He just started walking. Well, of course, we know the story. It's not only walking on water, but, but there was a storm. The storm kept kicking up. And when it gets close, they see the form of a human being walking on the water. And of course, they're scared. And Though they have seen Jesus do ridiculously amazing things, it still shocked them when He would do these kinds of things. And, and so Peter, being who Peter is, <coughs> he said, well, Lord, if it's you, then you command me. I want to do that too. And Jesus said, okay, come on. So the faith was present then for Peter to do that. Why? Well, he was believing in Jesus. He wasn't worried about all this other, which was still there. The storm, the water, the whole thing. You know, it's, I don't know if you know this, but it's not really normal for us to walk on top of water like that when it's deeper than about a, a trickle. We're just not supposed to do that kind of thing. And so Peter does step out of the boat under the authority or the faith of Jesus Christ. 
And we don't have record here of how long he was walking on the water, but he did step out and started walking until, uh, until he started looking around and thinking, well, I shouldn't be doing this. And then the faith starts to fade and the fear starts to rise and he starts to sink. That's just how life is. And he starts crying out to the Lord to save him and Jesus reached out and grabbed him and put him in the boat and then they went on from there. But Jesus said this, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Now everyone in this room knows why he did. We know why he did, but Jesus said to him, Why did you? Because what God is doing here is he's transferring his disciples from natural mindedness to God mindedness. And God mindedness doesn't mean that we can just do anything we want to do anytime and God's always going to take care of us. It's that we are led by God. He empowers us. So this faith that we talk about all the time, this faith has to come from God. It has to be Him that's doing this. Peter made a big mistake, but what God really was wanting to do through Christ was to teach Peter something about how to walk in faith all the time. I shared last week about experiences I had when I was in the radio business, uh, outside sales they call it, and I would be calling on 8 or 10, 15, 20, 30 people sometimes in a day and get turned down usually that many times. And how frustrating that was, of course, because ultimately my income was entirely dependent on whether or not those people bought something that I was selling. And I also had to deal with my own conscience. I couldn't just press people towards selling them something when I didn't think it was best for them, in this case for their business. So it was troublesome for me, and God was teaching me how to walk in faith. I could say it another way. He was teaching me how to walk on water. Did you know that that's what God expects of you every day, is to walk on water by faith? Walking on the waters of this life, of the circumstances of this life, we're not ignoring them. We're not saying they don't exist. We're not saying the physical afflictions that Lori's been dealing with don't exist. We're saying we're walking on water in faith in essence, above the situation. And this is how God wants His children to, to live. The word believe is the word pistuo, and it comes from the uh, faith word is the word pistis. That's a noun. Belief is a, is a verb. So believing in God is our job. We're going to read that here in just a moment. And it requires work. Uh, in fact, let's just read it. John 6, 29. Jesus said to them on one occasion, He said, This is the work of God, that you believe in Him whom He sent. He said, that's your job. That would be the job of those apostles He was talking to and disciples. And it's my job. My job is to believe in Jesus literally all the time. It's not about just a one-time experience of believing in Him so I can go to heaven. That's a good place to start. But then you entered into a life of faith, which you could also say, a life of walking on the water. And I'll tell you what I have seen through the years with many Christian people, and I have been guilty of this myself. And that is we either get lazy, we get afraid, we get insecure, whatever the reason for it, and we, we revert back to what the natural can do. You know, in our humanity, there are certain things we can typically do it seems to be that we can do those without God. Now, that's not true. But you learn certain things on your job, let's say. You learn how to do certain things. Or playing an instrument like Craig was playing earlier. Craig and I have had this discussion many, many, many times. You can become very talented and gifted with something and still not do it with the anointing of God. There's a big difference in that. Or another way to say it, to do it by faith. Craig started working with us some years ago in the church. He had already been trained to be a musician. He already had the gifting and, the, and, and some training to do so. But one of the things that was going to happen as he started working with us is he was going to then take that and lay it on the altar before the Lord, that gift, and let the Holy Spirit guide him. And this is a conversation we've had. Well, it's the same thing for every one of us in every matter of our life. Not just your job, not just the things that you might be gifted at doing, but literally to live every moment in faith. 
I'm going to read it here in a few minutes. The Bible says that it, something, anything that's not of faith is sin. So the we that are now faith people are supposed to be walking in faith all the time. And what happens with that is Jesus said, that's your job, that's your work. Well, most of you know that work can make you tired. This faith life can make you tired. That's why we have to do like Jesus did periodically. We've got to recharge. We've got to plug back in and recharge. Well, how do you do that? You do that with the Word of God, meditating in the Word. The presence of the Holy Spirit. You might be listening to a worship song and singing to the Lord. You might be declaring that. You might be talking to a friend. My wife and I, we have this discussion a lot. Uh, I learned this from another pastor years ago. Uh, he would come to the office and I would be there earlier than him doing some things on the computer. And when he would show up, uh, he would be just a little yancy for me to get done what I was doing because he wanted to talk. And the reason he did is he wanted the faith to flow. He wanted the river to flow. That's what he wanted to do. So my, my desk was over by the window in one of the rooms. And he'd come in there very conspicuously inconspicuous, standing next to me and kind of pace around with his hands behind his back, looking out the window as if that's really why he was in there. <laughs> what he was wanting was for me to get done so that we could start to talk. And he wanted to do that so that the river would flow. Sometimes we need to just let the river flow. So I got up the other day and Christy and I are in the same uh, room, our offices. Believe it or not, we don't hardly ever talk. Uh, Liz, you might need to know that. But <laughs> there are occasions, there are occasions that something will come up. But truly enough, Christy's pretty faithful to stay with her job, and I do too. But anyway, I got up and I walked over by the window and I was doing this as a joke and I put my hands behind my back and I said, I started kind of making noise like I need to talk. <laughs> Well, well, we'll save that for later. We got to get the flow. We got to get the river flowing. And the Lord spoke this to me about, um, I don't know, 20 years ago at least, as I was working through how to help people. And one of the things that I was seeing, and I'm talking about people now that are Christian people, I was seeing is that they really weren't becoming people of faith. Now, were they faith enough to be saved, if you can use that terminology? And there'd be some uh, theologians that would cry foul when I would say that. But you can't get saved without faith. We're going to read that verse here in a moment. But, but there's more to than just that moment of getting saved. It's a lifelong living by faith. And again, there are certain things we can kind of default to at times without recognizing we've even done it. And we're not even letting the faith engage. We don't think we need to. But see, that's a mistake on anyone's part. But you need to keep this picture in your mind of, of Peter. He got out of the boat, starts walking on the water. Now out there, he can't revert back to the natural. He's going to sink and die. If you thought that way, and if I thought that way on a regular basis, we would realize we can't live a moment without walking on the water by faith. Jesus said in John 11:40. He was talking to Mary and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus who had died. And he was in the tomb now, or the, the grave, whatever, it was in a tomb, for at least four days. And he said to them, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Jesus said, Not only is it our job to believe in him, but we believe in him so that we can see his glory. John 14, 1 says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Well, who was Jesus talking to? He was talking to his own disciples, his people. John 14, verse 12. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, that's Jesus, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Where did, that, where did that teaching originate? He said, if you believe in me. What was it that happened with Peter? He sees the ghost, and the ghost says, I'm Jesus. Don't be afraid, I'm Jesus. Peter says, well, if it's you, then you command me. That's where faith comes from. It comes from God. 
Sometimes God actually gives a faith by a word, as we say. He speaks a word to you. Other times you can just sense that He has given you faith for something. So Peter had faith. Why was it? Because Jesus said, come. That's all Peter needed to hear. He did the, the most ridiculously in, ignorant thing that a human being can do. He got out of a boat in the middle of the sea. And this is a professional fisherman. He knew what that meant. Now, he might be able to swim for a bit, but they were in a storm. So it was really a dumb thing for him to do. Now, not all, not all things that God has us do walking in faith we would call dumb. By God, none of them are. It's the wisdom of God. But sometimes to a natural mind, the things that God will have people do in the faith sounds ridiculous. In fact, if He has not had you do that, He will. Because there are times in walking in faith He expects us to do something that it's just not going to happen. It's just not going to happen unless God is in the middle of it. And He said, so if you believe in Me, then you're going to do some of the same works I'm doing. And you're going to ask in My name and these things are going to happen. John 20, verse 29. Jesus said to Thomas, this is now at the, after the resurrection, and Jesus has appeared to some of the other apostles and disciples, but Thomas wasn't in the room yet, and he said, I'm not going to believe. I'm not going to believe that he has raised, been raised from the dead until I can see the nail prints in his hand and feet and I can put my hand in his side where, where that spear was stuck. He said, I'm not going to believe. Well, that's... that's more basic humanity than we want to admit. It was very stupid of Thomas after all those years of seeing Jesus do what He did. Raising the dead, healing the sick, delivering the oppressed, feeding thousands with a sack lunch, walking on water, uh, up in the mountain when He was transfigured. These things that these guys had experienced. And yet Thomas still says, I'm not going to believe. You know, they say that uh, Missouri is what they call the show me state. You're going to have to show me. Well, I hate that. I wish we didn't live in the show me state because that's just arrogance and pride. It's stubbornness. That's all that is. But though I don't want to admit it, there have been times I have been there. And I would imagine you have as well. Where we're thinking, I, I can't do this. I told the story last week of Abraham. His name was Abram. He lived in a, a place thousands of miles, hundreds of miles from, from the Holy Land. And the Lord appeared to him when he was 75 years old. Think about that. As of yet, there's no one in this room even that old yet. He appeared to him and said, Abram, I want you to get up from where you're at and I want you to go to a place I will show you and I want you to take your family with you. Now that's all we have record in Scripture of him telling him. He didn't say where he was going. He didn't say what to expect after he got there. He just said, I want you to do this. And he became the father of our faith by listening to God one moment at a time and doing what he told him to do. And that's why we call Abraham the father of our faith. And so this life of God's walking on water that he wants us to experience. Like I said, I... Uh, let me, tell you, let me tell you something about Christians. Uh, most of them are well-meaning. In fact, I hope they all are. I hope they all are. If they truly are born again, I hope they are. But what I have not found is that they always know how to walk in faith and or they don't want to. Because honestly, walking in faith is always going to cost something. It is work. As Jesus said, this is your job. This is your work. <laughs> to believe on the one God the Father sent. That's Jesus. Believe Him. That's the job. And walking in faith, at least when you're first learning how to do this, can kind of wear you slick. And why is that? Because it goes against your flesh. The flesh is trying to pull you this way, and the Spirit is taking you this way. Craig has a dog. He's a very famous dog. His name is Jax. And I've met the dog. He's got quite a personality. I have known dogs through my life. Some are, they're all different. They're like humans. They're all very different. Uh, but from what Craig tells me, when they go on their daily walk or walks, typically on the front end of that walk, Jax is, is just about to pull Craig down the road. 
and Craig's big enough to keep that from happening, but I've watched people coming down our street in front of our house. My office has a big window and I can see the sidewalk and people are walking their dogs and a lot of them poop in our yard, thanks, thanks for that. But anyway, you're watching this happen and there, there are times that there's a person that's with the dog that's not quite big enough to handle the dog. And I've seen it literally happen that sometimes those dogs are yanking that person down the sidewalk. Well, that's what Jack's on occasion is trying to do with Craig. I think near the end of the walk, he starts to mellow some, doesn't he? Here's the problem with human fallen flesh. It does that with God too. It tries to yank on him and pull God the way that our flesh wants to go. And the thing is, if it was all good for us, God would allow it to be so. He's never going to require something of me that isn't good for me. But what he's doing is he's taking our flesh to the cross so that we can actually be a people of the faith. So that we can actually be those kind of people that ask in his name. Now we're not saying he's become our head butler. That's not what that means when Jesus said that. It wasn't like, well, okay, from this point on, every time I speak in Jesus' name, it's just going to happen just like that. But he's saying you believe in him. That's your job. That's faith. And then when you ask. And so rather than allowing my flesh to try to pull me away from what's good for me, I'm learning to yield my flesh to the cross and die. What I'm doing is I'm yielding my will to God for his will to be done. Now sometimes, as we've said before, that isn't always entirely clear. We have to wait sometimes until it is. You know, I have faith for certain things without waiting a long time. I just have the faith to do it, the moment of doing this. But there are other times that, that we may need to hold up and wait just a bit until we have the faith because the scripture does say whatever is not of faith is sin. Ephesians 2, uh, I'm sorry, Hebrews 12:2 says, looking unto Jesus, he is the author and the finisher of our faith. We're talking about walking on water. Lori needs to walk on water every day. Liz needs to walk on water. Sherry, all of us need to do this. Well, how do you do it? You do the same thing that Peter did. Look at Jesus, looking unto Jesus. When Peter had his eye on Christ, he was walking on water. He could be aware of the fact that he's walking on water and I'm aware of the fact that there still is a storm going on, but what is the difference? He's still looking at Jesus. And that's how this faith works. I'll tell you what, I think you've seen this in your life. There are times that experiences can come our way that just overwhelm us. And at times, it's very difficult for us to focus back on Jesus. He will help us, but we may need some help. We may need some others to help us too. The Holy Spirit's always going to be there. The Word's always going to be there. The truth is always going to be there. But you know, it really is God's doing that He put us together in a body of people. And so we can be strong for the other at times when they are not as strong and then they can be strong for us at times when we're not. This is the way this is supposed to go. And we're looking unto Jesus because He's the author. That just means He started it all. He, he's the one that began the faith. He, he's the founder, but he's the finisher. He's the one that completes our faith, both in this life and the forever that's yet to come. Paul says in Ephesians 2.8, we've already quoted it. He says, by grace you've been saved through faith. That's not of yourself. It's a gift of God. Galatians 2.20, my favorite verse in the Bible. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. Romans 10 verse 8. If you want to know a formula, and there is no such thing, but a formula of how a person is saved, it's here, Romans 10, verse 8. But what does it say? The word is near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith, which we preach, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes, that's believing, unto righteousness. And with your mouth, confession is made unto salvation. He's saying it's a, it's a dual happening between your heart and what you speak. It's not a formula, no, but it is a, it is a flow. It's the heart believes because God literally put faith in your heart. That was what I just read earlier, 
Ephesians 2 8. He gave you the faith. Now he wants you to use it. And one of the things we do in using the faith is we speak. I quoted those verses there uh, a summer and, and a half ago back when we uh, baptized Lori and, and Owen in, in the holy pool, glorious holy pool. I quoted these verses. Now, both were already saved, but we're quoting how this life works. It's not just the moment of time that you actually were first born again. The word there to be saved is the word seizo. It means to be made whole. And it's something we do all the time. I keep believing in my heart and I keep confessing with my mouth. And as long as I am doing that, I will be walking on water. That doesn't mean all the problems instantly go away. It doesn't mean everything changes in an instant. But I am walking on water. Why? Because I'm believing in my heart and I'm confessing with my mouth. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. You know, sometimes I just need to confess it to myself. I think many of you do that. Other times I may need to hear someone else confess it to me. Or you're listening to a song, right, Sherry? Liz, all of you, Lori, everyone does this. There are a lot of songs out there these days that have got a lot of truth in them. And you're hearing a song. By the way, God did create music. I don't know if we know that, but He did. Not all music glorifies Him, but He created music. And in a song, you know, you can hear the words of truth. And it can grab you. You know, it can set you free. It can, it can encourage you. It can strengthen you. It can even direct you. It can give you direction. Those kinds of things. And you know something else? Uh, this thing, I'm going to have to have Liz look at it when we're done here. <laughs> I it started doing this for the first time the other uh, day when I was working on it. It's never done this before. Within about 30 seconds, it starts to go dim. I mean, I tried to fix it, and I obviously didn't fix it. Um, of course, I get to messing with that, and then I forget where I was going. The Word of God that I speak or that I hear from someone else, uh, music, songs, the kinds of things that God uses. I was driving down the road. This is where I was at one day, and, and I saw a sign, <clears throat> and it said, Straight Ahead. Well, you know what the sign was about? Is uh, George Strait was coming to town or somewhere nearby and he was going to have a concert and he said straight ahead a picture of George Strait and the Lord spoke to me for me to keep my faith straight ahead well it was at a time when it felt like all hell was breaking loose I'll be honest with you well, what do you mean straight ahead he meant keep your eyes on me Jesus keep your eyes right here straight ahead and I'll take care of you I watch sports and football and stuff, and I was watching one of the college games, actually several, yesterday. I really like watching the college almost more than the pro, although you got to admit the pros are good, some of them. Anyway, this one running back from Missouri, did you see that game yesterday, Missouri? They got a running back that played in, in D2 for three years, and uh, Missouri, of course, has always been hurting for certain to get good talent. And so someone told the current coach that this, this running back, and he's not huge, and he's, he's not necessarily the fastest you'll ever see, but they said, you need, to, you need to look at this guy. He had been over there three years. It was here in Missouri at one of the little schools. And so they, they contacted him, got to talking to him, brought him to training camp or whatever they call it in college. And, and offered him to stay. I don't even know if they gave him a scholarship. I can't say. That guy's tearing it up. I mean, he literally, they cannot stop him. I've seen him play three or four games now, and they can't stop this guy. He's not as big as some. He's not as fast as some. They just can't tackle him. And he's, he's very matter of fact. He doesn't show off, you know, like some do. He just runs the ball, and they can't stop him. He, he got 200 and some yards yesterday against Tennessee. That's a pretty good day. He's the only running back they use. They don't do that anymore either, even in college. And I say that I was watching him, 
and it's, you know, the good ones are all the same. I mean, they do some of the same kind of stuff, but they hand him the ball and there's a plan that he's supposed to go this way typically or that way. And sometimes that closes off. You know how it is. Life does that to us. And, and he has a way of, of waiting just enough to find the next gap or even to create a gap is what he was doing. But I watched him. He got right behind the big, big center from Missouri. And he was just following. It's like he had a hold of his belt and he was letting that guy pull him and that guy was just shoving people out of the way. And you know, that's the ideal way for it to be. Well, that's kind of what I'm talking about. Let's let Jesus get in front. He's really better at this. He's a lot bigger. He's a lot smarter. He's just better at this. And as I do that, now I have not meant to, but I've started off behind Jesus, letting him do the blocking for me, and then I get Yancey and I start taking off in other directions. And that's when you're going to get creamed in life, typically. Now, he lets us get creamed on occasion, God does, to teach us a few lessons, right? Then we back up and we say, well, I need to learn how to walk in faith. Now, walking on the water, it is our life of faith. You already know this, but Matthew 14, verse 28. Peter said to him, Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to the water. That's what we've already talked about. Jesus said, come. Peter got down out of the boat. He walked on the water to go to Jesus. This is our life, walking on water. I'm going to tell you right now, uh, as best I know, I've been walking on water for a long time. Listen, there have been some of those times, though, in the last few years where I started to, I could feel myself sinking. You know, I'm not on top of the water as well as I was. I can feel it's up to about my knee now. You know, I'm starting to sink down just a little bit. And after a while, if you learn to walk in faith, you start seeing that. You start recognizing, well, wait a minute. I'm starting to sink in my faith. I need to back up and focus on what got me here, and that is focused on Jesus, seeing His face, hearing His voice, His Word. John 21, 21. Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and you do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also, if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. Romans 1, verse 16. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. You guys know this, but it's, this is a faith life. In fact, the entire gospel of John uh, in, in Bible school, they call the gospel of John the gospel of belief because of the number of times that John uses that, that uh, word to believe. The verb form of the, of the noun form of faith is to believe. It's what I do. Faith, God gave it to me. It was a gift. Belief is what I do with it. I use it. I ex exercise it. Verse 17, For in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Over in Jude, verse 20. Beloved, build yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Now here I'm confident he is talking about spiritual language or tongues. But every prayer I pray needs to be a prayer of the Spirit too. Romans chapter 8 says, Paul said, you know, there's times we just don't know how to pray as we should. I mean, it'd be great if we did, but we just don't always know. And he said, so the Holy Spirit, he's present to help us to know how to pray. So this faith to walk on water, something else we need to know, it pleases God. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 says, Faith is the substance of the things we hope for. It's the evidence of the things not seen, meaning it hasn't come to pass yet, but you have the faith now. Faith is always now about something that's yet to come. Hope is yet to come as well, but faith is a substance. It's, it's that I actually have a substance that God has given me a word or a knowing. But then he adds in verse 6, without faith it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I have read this verse to myself and to others many, many years now. 
without faith it's impossible to please God. And I believe this to be true, what I'm going to say. I believe that every genuine Christian does want to please God. I believe they do. But I also know that that war goes on with our flesh that I've been talking about here today. The flesh does not desire to please God. Don't kid yourself. There isn't anything about my flesh that wants to please God. My spirit man in Christ does. Jesus said the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. Paul talks about this in Romans. He said, with my mind, he said, I want to obey the Lord, but my flesh gets in the way. So this is a struggle that we do deal with. Now there is an answer. The answer is the cross of Christ. It's humbling myself before him. It's letting his word and his spirit speak to me and direct me, but also make the reality of what happened about 2,000 years ago, everyone in this room went with Jesus when he died. Everyone in this room did, and then all that have known Jesus and ever will, it was true of them and us, we were with him when he died. That is a reality. Then we were with him when he came to life. And now we are with him forever, wherever he's at, including at the Father's right hand. And what God has been showing me for years now is it's important for me to want to please my Father. You know, in this natural world we live in, it's bred into us to want to please our parents, especially, and people we care about. Now, parents haven't always done a good job of being parents. Some have done pretty awful. Others have done better. But the fact and the reality is it's not a bad thing to want to please your parents as long as it's being led by the Lord, of course. Sometimes that could lead us astray if our parents are gone astray. But we really need to and want to please our Father, our Heavenly Father. It is, it is bred into us, it's built into us, this intense desire, not just to get his attaboys, although he does do that. He says, well done, son or daughter. But it's that there's that knowing that you're pleasing the Father. And then there's that place where we can also please others in a, in a, in a right kind of way. They talk about people that are pe people pleasers. And in that context, typically we're talking about something that's not real positive. They're, they're probably compromising in life in order to please someone else. They're giving up something in order to do that. And that's not what we're talking about. But I want to please the Lord. I want to please my Father. And the scripture says something that's very powerful. It says, without faith, it's impossible to please Him. You can have every good intention. There are people all over the world today with good intentions that are not walking in faith. They're not pleasing God. I'm not saying that He's angry that they're giving to the poor or that they're helping someone rebuild their house after it was destroyed. I'm not saying that He's displeased with that. But the pleasure of God comes from people that are walking in faith. I talked to a friend of ours a few years ago, a good Christian man, goes to another church, and he, he's a very talented uh, carpenter. And one of the things that just brought him pleasure in life was to help other people when they have need. And so he and a bunch of other guys in his church would get together and people in their church, they might find out had an, their, maybe their sidewalk got busted. Well, they would just go out on a Saturday and repair the, and replace the sidewalk. Or they had a problem with their roof and they would go fix that because they were talented and gifted enough to do it. And then also they would take those teams at times and go to other parts of the country to help people as well. Hurricanes and things like that would arise, tornadoes. And what I, was saying to my friend when I was, he was telling about this is, well, that's all kind of right. You know, it's, it's taking giftings that we have to love others. But when we're doing that, if we're doing it by faith, and I do believe he was, I believe this was something that God put in his heart by faith. If we're doing it by faith, you know what it does? It pleases God. John 15 verse seven says, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you. That word abide just means live there. You just meditate on him as much as you can all day long. He said, then you can ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. 
My, my, uh, it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so that you will be my disciples. This bearing fruit pleases God. Well, how do we do that? We believe in Jesus. And we do what He says. We, we let Him lead us. We are, we're a people that are walking on the water. You know, when Peter got out of that boat and was walking on the water, Jesus was pleased. He was impressed. My son's walking on the water. This is a good thing. Then his son started looking around and thinking about, I shouldn't be doing this, and he starts sinking. And then he starts falling, calling out, Save me, Lord! Save me, Lord! Which we've all done. And Jesus did, because He does love us. His mercy and grace are great. But then He said to him, and it was, it was a corrective word. It was a loving word, but He said, Why did you doubt? Uh, here, a few months ago, I had shared this with my wife. I don't know that I've ever shared it with anyone else. The Lord was talking to me one day, and He said, Rick, why did you doubt? There was a very specific circumstance before me at that moment. And here's the thing, I didn't know I had at that moment. I did not know that I had doubted, but I had. And how did I know? Because he told me. He said, why did you doubt? God was not trying to beat me down, as they say. He was lovingly correcting me. And you know what? For those of us that have any wisdom at all, we say, thank you, Lord. Because I went back to him just like that, and I said, forgive me. I had no intention, but I did doubt. I am sorry. Please forgive me. And there's a release that comes with that. You know what I mean? True repentance, release. And you know what else comes? Faith. Faith bolsters because Paul said it this way. He said, God is working faith to faith to faith to faith to faith. Your faith is growing. He's transforming us. Our faith is increasing. Romans 14, 23, I've already quoted it several times, says, whatever is not from faith, it is sin. It's a good thing for us to remember that. John says it this way in 1 John chapter 3, verse 22. Whatever we ask from Him, whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. Pleasing God by faith. And this is the commandment that we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ. Love one another as He gave us commandment. He who keeps His commandments abides in Him. And He in Him, by this we know that He abides in us, by this the Spirit whom He has given us. We know this, we know this. What is this saying? I need to keep believing so I can please the Lord. So we can walk this out. And in my believing, one of the things I'm going to be doing is obeying. You cannot say that you're a person of faith if you don't practice obeying. We can't say that. We have to come back if we've stopped obeying and stopped believing and fix that. And again, that can happen. There can be times, ignorantly or on purpose, that we have kind of backed off. We've, we've, we've wanted to go the, the natural route. This is too hard. I've heard Christians say this to me how many times I don't know. And the thing is, I've said it too. This is hard. This is hard. Why? Because my flesh doesn't want to go that way and because the world as a whole doesn't want you going the right way either. And so sometimes we're having to go, as they say, against the stream, against upstream with the Lord. But God Himself is there. If we believe on the name of Jesus Christ. 1 John 5, 4. Whatever is born of God, it overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world. It's our faith. Well, I mean, how can I say this any other way? This whole life is about us believing in the Lord. And you didn't create the faith. He gave it to you. But once you've got it, He expects us to use it. They came up with this phrase years ago, primarily in, in the world of, of sports and training, use it or lose it. Uh, when I had my uh, leg in a cast for two months after I had my, tore my Achilles tendon and they operated, repaired it, put me in a cast up to my, up to my uh, hip the first month, took that one off, put a cast right below my knee for another month. So I had a cast on my K5 
calf area for, um, for two months. <laughs> and I've said this before, when they took that final cast off and I looked down there, that my calf looked like a little girl. <laughs> and I mean that to sound like a put down. <laughs> it looked like a little girl. Now, there's girls in this room and I'm not talking about women, but I'm talking about a, a little girl. It looked, I was, I was embarrassed. And it was summertime and you still wore shorts. Well, my goodness, that was kind of embarrassing too. Use it or lose it is a principle of truth when it comes to faith. We either use it or we don't. And God wants us to be using it. Why? Because it pleases Him and it blesses us. Everything I do by faith is good for me. Well, the last thing. We must never stop walking on the water. Well, we saw the story with Peter. How did that, was that, how was that going to end for him if Jesus hadn't been there? Well, we'd have been minus one, one apostle and he had had to pick out another one because he wasn't going to make it in that storm. Matthew 7, verse 7 says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. This is, by the way, Jesus talking. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds, to him who knocks it will be open. In the Greek world, the Greek language that this verse was written in these verses, these words are what's called Greek imperatives, which means present tense, continuing petition, meaning what he would be saying is ask and keep on asking. That's what literally the, the verbs mean. Seek and keep on seeking, knock and keep on knocking. So what he's saying is, it's not like you say it one time and then assume it should be done. I heard faith people, they call themselves faith people years ago say, you should only have to ask once. Well, that may be true on some occasions. A parent, when they're teaching their child how to obey, they need to learn to hear the voice once. But this is not like that. This is us asking from God. And he said, you ask until you receive. Now, he doesn't mean by that just to ask until you totally wear them slick like little children can do. Mommy, 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 mommy. Children are untiring when it comes to some of those things. But he's talking about doing it in faith. You need to ask because we believe in Jesus, right? We're not asking just because we're sinking here. We believe in him and we're asking because we do. We're seeking because we are in him. We believe in Him. We're knocking. And He said, if you do this, there will be an answer. Now, I do, I do need to qualify that by saying it will be the answer God gives me. Whatever that answer is. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, we walk by faith and not by sight. Hebrews 10, verse 35, this is how we'll finish the day. It says, do not cast away your confidence. It has great reward. You have need of endurance so that after you've done the will of God, you may receive the promise. That endurance is his faith. Faith, enduring faith, staying with the faith, stay with the faith, stay with the faith. The Lord spoke this to me about 15 years ago in a time of great difficulty that we were going through. And he said, uh, he said to me, he was actually quoting something from Revelation in chapter 3, but he says, hold fast what you have let no one take your crown. That's what he said to me. Hold fast what you have and don't let anyone take your crown. Well, what, what do you mean by that? Whatever I have is what he has given me. The faith, the truth that he has given me. And there was going to be, and there were people, sometimes good meaning people, that were trying to lead me away from what God had given me. And he said, don't do that. Hold fast. Well, sometimes that makes us unpopular. I don't like that. I don't think you do like that either. But I have to stay true to the faith. He said, you have need of endurance so that after you've done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Well, how long does that take? Well, this is the answer I always hated when my dad would say it. He would say, as long as it takes. I would say, well, how long is this going to last? Well, as long as it takes. You know, I didn't like hearing that, but it is a, a spiritual truth. Some would say, well, how long do we wait on God to do something? Well, there's nothing in the Bible that answers that question. 
except stay with the faith until the answer comes. Verse 37, yet a little while he who is coming will come and he will not tarry. Now the just, that's us, people that are in Christ, the just shall live by faith. And if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. He's saying we're drawing back from the faith. We're drawing back from believing in him and God saying, I have no pleasure in my children when they do that. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Craig, would you want to come and help me, please? I'm going to leave this on and ask Liz if she'll check it for me later to see if she can fix it. Because that was downright annoying. I was having to poke that thing every 15 seconds. Craig, what do you think? Father, I thank you today because you're greater than everything. You created everything. You created all this world and universe as we know it with just a word. How incredible. And the Bible says that you sustain it and hold it together with just a word. Well, that word, when it comes to us, it brings faith faith in our heart. That faith is a gift. It's a gift of your grace. It's something that we didn't earn and something we can't create. But you certainly want us to use it once we have it. Not just faith to make it to heaven, but faith to live. Faith to walk. Faith to walk on the top of the water rather than being engulfed by everything that comes our way because this world can sure get difficult at times. We can be tried and tested and overwhelmed. But you've said we're seated with you in heavenly places, right? At the Father's right hand in Christ and in the same way we're also a people that while we're here on this earth, you want us to walk on the water. We're certainly not doing it to try to show off we're doing it because that's what pleases you. We're saying those circumstances will not control us. The world says it will, they will not define us. And it's true. The things that we're dealing with are real, but you're more real. And even in the midst of a great storm out in the middle of a great sea, Jesus, you told Peter, go ahead, come on out walk on this water with me. And he did for a bit and then he didn't. But Lord, you want me and you want us to be a people that walk on the water all the time. Oh, you love us. And there have been so many times that we started maybe walking on water and we got tired or fearful and we started to sink. And you're so merciful and gracious to, to save us and I thank you for that. Because your intention is our, our ultimate victory. But Lord, I thank you today that you continue to take us back to those times to walk in water, walk on top of it, to, to know what it's like to actually live in the faith, to be a person of the faith, abiding in you and your word abiding in us and, and that we can speak and ask and, and that you actually hear us and you want to do, you want to do those things. And Lord, today I want to please you. Father, I want to please you. And the only way that's possible is through Jesus Christ. And I believe in Jesus. And I love Jesus. And I love hearing his voice. And I love knowing his will. I sing praises to thy name. O Most High, I sing praises to Thy name, O Holy One, for Thou art worthy, worthy to praises, praises, Jesus, Jesus, you make all to be, 
Jesus. 